Hi everyone, thank you so much. Thank you Sonic Acts. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been a very intense uh, period recently, so I have to apologize in advance that I actually haven't had time to process a lot of the recent material and include it in my talk today, but I thought I'd give a general overview of this project that I've been working on for a very long time. I'm actually really grateful um, to be second this morning rather than first because um, Daphina's talk is really um, aligned with the next uh, section of my film where in fact we will be shooting the Wanganui River precisely because we're thinking around alternative ways of uh, responding to climate emergency. Um, so I'd like to time myself because I don't like going over. Okay, um, so the project I'm working on, it's been a kind of long term, it started off as a sound project and then a short film, and basically it kind of exploded into a feature film. So last night I premiered uh, the kind of Dutch chapter of, of it, so to speak, which was commissioned by Sonic Axe, which was called The Future Waters of the Storm Surge, and I'm not really going to talk about it because I assume many of you were there yesterday and I addressed it yesterday. So I'm going to talk about it in the context of a wider project. Um, so um, as I said, I've been recycling um, my PowerPoint. So <laughs> I'm going to ad lib through this, but there will be some text in the background, but I'm not going to read it, so to speak. So the project is really, I suppose, in, on the one hand, it's a kind of diagnosis of our current understanding of emergency through the trope of the siren, through this metaphor. Um, and I guess uh, reality and kind of sonic uh, expression as well. But it's not only about sound. Um, it's about this idea of the siren as a way of understanding what warning might be. And in part, it's, as I said, it's diagnostic of the current way in which we are suffering from um, or enduring alarm fatigue. So we're exhausted both sonically, so we're not hearing things in the public sphere in the same way that we might have done in the past. Um, but also this notion of like being in a state of emergency constantly is kind of clouding our ability both to understand what the emergency is and uh, kind of recalibrate our response to it. So um, the project looks at sirens in different contexts. The ones in the Netherlands are um, specific to the Zealand. I'm not going to pronounce the other name of it because I can't. <laughs> um, but it's a nine kilometer um, kind of bridge slash um, barrier um, that is um, maybe interesting to point out that the, the further I go into this project, the more I appreciate that many sirens are almost like burial points. They're almost a kind of monument to past traumas. So, you know, there's storms and then in thinking around the future and, and in kind of setting up warning signals for the future. And you can think of like Chernobyl or Fukushima also kind of alerting other uh, uh, nuclear sites around the possibilities of how a disaster might unfold. So this idea of the siren kind of being really rooted in a state of um, past catastrophe. But I suppose um, where my project um, differs, um, or I guess the kind of rereading I'm working through in relation to the siren, again, both literal and metaphorical, um, is in this notion of like, what do we, we, what do we mean by warning? So actually, this is just a slide I put together sloppily <laughs> this morning. Um, but I was in America, um, shooting, um, I went to check out, um, factories of, um, siren, um, of siren, not just the actual sirens, but siren infrastructure. So when, when you, when you kind of buy a siren, you're also buying like a whole alerting system and a network that connects to a satellite and so forth. Um, and what was so interesting about going there is again, um, actually one of the things they said that taps into what I was talking about earlier is that, um, unfortunately their business does well when there are catastrophes. So for example, when I was there, there was the Florida, um, the word is gone. Anyway, the disaster in Florida. And, um, and they were saying, you know, so now suddenly we're getting a lot of requests for, um, um, siren infrastructures and emergency signal, uh, broadcasting. Um, but it's really this notion that many of the sirens that are in factories haven't yet been assigned, uh, which aspect of emergency they're speaking to. And so, um, when I was there, what was so interesting is, um, 
Also, just to note that, for example, one of the companies that I went to visit, Federal Signal, has the huge monopolies over um, countries, entire countries. So, for example, they very proudly uh, pointed out that they have all of the Netherlands. So, actually, most of the sirens in the Netherlands are made in America by Federal Signal. So, even this idea of like what the trade um, routes are of like emergency signaling and who sets the tone or the kind of crisis management, um, well, the understanding of what warning is, but also the understanding of like how you might communicate this to a public and um, and kind of, um, yeah, I guess what the response is. So this brings me to the kind of um, working definition of the siren. And um, I touched upon this briefly yesterday, but really, um, as I said, the project is on the one hand diagnostic and it's a documentary, experimental, artist it's an artist documentary, it's not a traditional one. But um, but yeah, so the footage of the film, I guess, is more diagnostic, and the conversations and the research I'm doing around it obviously are as well. But actually within the musical elements, so the compositions that I'm inviting different um, collaborators to kind of imagine with me are the propositional um, part of the project. So really it's about trying to reimagine what the siren's call might be. Um, trying to recompose the siren and in that sense it's both kind of a counter imaginative speculative response to this question of alarm fatigue but it's also about exploding what we mean by warning and who that the warning is for and so when I approach musicians I have a kind of working definition of the siren which is um, kind of releasing it from its history and the kind of typical associations that, you know, we know what it sounds like. And as I said, if it's a kind of burial site for past trauma, so we hear the siren and we think World War, you know, Cold War or um, World War Two or World War One, you know, we or right now Russia and uh, Ukraine, you know, we kind of have these very uh, grounded signifiers of like what the siren comes to represent. But what I'm trying to do is like break free from that and reimagine it. And to do this, as I said, I have a working definition, which is that the siren is first and foremost a call to attention. Next, it's a call to action. So it's an instruction. So it's a sound that is telling you to do something. And lastly, I think the bit that's become more and more prominent, and that's where um, the Wanganui River precedent is really interesting to me, is that it has within it this, it folds into it the notion of a possible future. So the siren isn't just this trauma from the past and kind of, uh, I guess, a kind of, you know, a kind of trigger uh, as much as a warning. So a trigger from past traumas, but a kind of warning that, you know, these catastrophes might recur, especially as some of the catastrophes we're facing are potentially unprecedented or we don't know what we what they look like or we can't imagine the scale of what they might be not just in the near future but especially in the deep future and so this notion of the future is really important to me and imagining alternative ways of responding to the siren's call and within that you get this um, kind of breakdown of like okay whose attention you know who's the siren calling out for so for example a musician I worked with um, Fujita but also um, Laurie Spiegel, um, have worked with field recordings of animals. Um, um, so Fujita worked with insect sounds, and Laurie worked with a whole range of different animal howls, growls, sounds. And this idea of like, okay, well, maybe, like, is that a siren? Can we, can we reconceptualize the siren a little bit like what we just heard around the idea of like a human right to water? What about nature's right to water? So in terms of warning, like um, someone I was talking to early on in the project, Again, it's been a kind of process of um, kind of disassembling and reassembling and exploding and then contracting. But, you know, like, is a bleached coral reef a siren, for example? You know, what do we mean by warning? Um, so, yeah, as I said, this idea of, like, the siren holding space for the future, for an alternative future, is really important to me in this project. And maybe unexpected for many people when they think of the siren, I don't think it's necessarily read of read in relation to that idea. And um, sorry, I should probably move through a bit faster. Um, and so when I've been filming, um, what's been really interesting is that you know this research is maybe five years, nearly six now, um, and it's kind of changed through, um, I guess what shape it might take, um, but the kind of, the 
obsessive compulsive <laughs> drive to kind of unpack what we mean by warning has become really um it's become really sustaining and i feel like i'm learning so much through it i'm learning so much being here as part of sonic act it's such a great program that fits really beautifully with a lot of the things i've been thinking about and working through um but also i guess what i was going to say is that um often the conversations that i have with people with musicians with researchers with specialists in the field so i've been speaking to a uh, nuclear policy advisor or um, someone from the noise abatement society in the uk um, a cognitive psychologist who's done a lot of work around alarms and alerts and actually specifically within a hospital context so if you can imagine you know the way the world is currently um, kind of sonically devised is that everything is beeping from your seatbelt to your microwave, like everything is signaling through sound and it hasn't been thought about from a kind of design perspective really in that way. So it hasn't been kind of comp composed thoughtfully, it's like which sound will we respond to best and instead what's happening is this kind of rising cacoph cacophony of yeah, alarm fatigue, um, which as I said is both kind of literal and metaphorical. Um, but what I was going to say around the footage is that, you know, as I film different sites, I, I've kind of started to understand different things around the topics that I'm looking at. And so there's been this kind of to and fro in terms of like identifying a location that will speak to the project and that will maybe cinematically also capture some of these images in a very efficient way. So for example, um, I did a remote shoot during the pandemic in Fukushima, which was really interesting to do, even in terms of like considering one's carbon footprint, you know, like not going there, but working with local people. I had a kind of DP avatar who was a local um, documentary filmmaker who'd done a lot of work around Fukushima and was originally born there. And, and we kind of did it overnight um, via WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was an interesting work setup, but you know, as I shot there, uh, I kind of started to realize a whole range of things, including, um, yeah, so I kind of, not always, but quite often need a siren in the frame in order to start to articulate these landscapes of threat, which I think otherwise, you know, need a lot of unpacking and the film doesn't really have talking heads as such. Um, it does have these specific moments of voices of people that are articulating an alternative notion of crisis response. Like that's really the important bit. And they are kind of, emergency warning lights so their voices are modulated as as a light literally and so in some sense they're both the warning and the beacon or the point of orientation or the guiding kind of map and so that's um as i said this project faces forward and in some ways it's also about listening listening ahead and i'm not quite sure what i mean by that yet <laughs> but i'm really interested in this idea of like listening towards the possibility of future and um, yeah, so um, maybe to kind of bring it into the subject of water, I guess one of the things that became really apparent when I shot in Fukushima and when I shot here in the Netherlands um, and a few other sites is, you know, as you're kind of articulating what the edge of threat might be, both cinematically and, and then kind of conceptually thinking it through, I started to uh, appreciate that many sirens are actually kind of... Um, they're embedded within a wider preventive architecture. So the seawall um, is really about kind of keeping this notion of like potential um, threat coming from the sea out. Um, and um, something, I can't remember if this came up in conversation yesterday, but something really interesting about the project has also been that, you know, um, say in Fukushima, I don't know if I have an image. Uh, no, I don't have an image of that. Um, but in Fukushima, you know, the siren that's next to the um, seawall, um, there were many debates when the seawall was being built up. It's now 10 years, I think, also. Um, that it meant that people could no longer see um, the water and kind of understand warning signs beyond relying on, like, siren infrastructure. So basically relying on the fact that the state, you know, the trusting the state will warn you in time, give you enough notice, um, rather than being attuned to nature and listening to it. And I guess um, when I was working with BJ Nelson on this project, we really thought about the sound of wind as like, like is wind a possible, what's the word, portent? You know, like a possible 
So again, this notion of the siren starts to dissolve when you think, well, like if a siren is a call to attention and a call to action and some notion of like, okay, there's an exit route from this potential danger, then all kinds of other things, um, like in the work I've been doing, like I'm thinking about smoke, you know, so smoke is an early form of long distance signal communication, but it's also potentially a warning or a symptom of fire or a signal. And so this thing of like, what is actually signaling to us? And also how does, how do these elements of nature, like how do we understand threat or how do we sense? Um, someone I was talking to recently when we were talking about preemptive listening, they were talking about this idea of sensing it coming, which is like, a, like dogs might or nature might sense something about to happen, you know, whether it's a tsunami or something else. Um, just moving forward. Yeah, so I mean, actually the project has so far focused um, extensively on notions of like climate and industrial threat, but um, I'm about to do a shoot, as I said, in the Wanganui River and kind of thinking about other notions of like how we might understand threat and threat to who. So, you know, who's the siren for? So um, there's this Maori concept of rahui, which is basically that you let... Uh, natural entities, I want to call them resources, though I guess they are, but like that you let them rest when they need that time so they're protected. So again, this notion of like protective measures in place, not necessarily from an anthropocentric perspective. Um, as I was saying earlier, um, like Fukushima was a really good example because we understand the siren, I guess the fire is the best example, is that, you know, there's a there's um, smoke, then there's a fire, then there's potentially, um, well, at the point at which there's smoke, there's a siren, and then the fire, um, the fire brigade comes and puts out the fire, and then over the course of the last few summers, we've seen many, many fires, and this is indicating this kind of hyper-object of like something much uh, wider, kind of slower violence than the incident, the singular incident of the fire. And this was actually something we shot there, which, again, kind of cinematically helps articulate this idea, which is uh, a fire station frozen at the time at which the tsunami hit, which had a bell, which is part of the prehistory of the siren as well, and sirens on it. And of course, it can't possibly signal nuclear catastrophe. There's this problem around nuclear where, you know, okay, you're going to warn, but what do you ever, you know, what future, how much future is folded into a possible nuclear warning? There isn't one, really. Um, this was a siren um, junkyard in the US, which has been uh, a kind of key m way of thinking around like what happens when the sirens we currently have are no longer effective, um, they're no longer effectively signaling the crisis that we're facing, which I guess is the kind of overarching diagnosis of the project and, and kind of um, provocation, which is like, okay, what if we try to imagine alternative ways of working through this? Um, and what was really fascinating when I shot it um, just recently is that I had overlaid this in a rough cut with the siren by Fujita with these insect sounds because I felt like, okay, the sirens are silent. You know, there's this graveyard of sirens. What sounds emerge? And I tried a few different ones of the, I've got about 15 different siren propositions, some which you heard, um, some of my collaborators you might have heard last night if you were here. Um, and I kind of um, just tried it with this insect uh, siren soundtrack and it worked so well because again in terms of thinking around the kind of audio visual language it activated the soil and the air and all the space around the siren and it brought up this possibility of like okay what would a different siren sound like for a different species for example and then when I was there it was amazing because of course um, I mean I shot it in the daytime and then at night and it um the soundtrack, uh, the soundtrack, the sound of being there was actually crickets and cicadas and later on in the evening frogs. It was amazing. Um, so I didn't expect it. You know, the first uh, recce that we did, I had someone do it for me remotely. But then when I was there in person, there was this kind of interesting overlap. So as I said, um, my brain is exploding with overstimulation because a lot has happened over the last two months um, and I haven't had a lot of time to process. So this is a shoot we did over the summer in Scotland in Grangemouth, uh, a huge oil refinery, um, gas, petrol, just a whole range of things. Um, 
This is a siren on a water tower in Lapland, which interestingly, um, when we shot it, it was um, just as Putin was potentially threatening um, nuclear. I mean, that's kind of old news now, but at that point it was kind of quite uh, raw. And this um, siren in Lapland, um, as we were researching it, had been um, had been used, I think, to um, signal the fallout from Chernobyl because Finland is obviously close to the border. So, um, yeah. Um, I don't really have time to show a little clip, um, so I might leave that for now because I think my time is up. Um, but thank you so much for listening and apologies for the slightly improvised nature of the talk. <laughs>